Welcome everybody who's joining this uh, webinar hosted by Wellbeing of Women. And this is one of a series of webinars that we've been running entitled Let's Talk Periods. Why do we want to talk about them? Well, because periods are an incredibly common issue in women's lives. Most of the girls and women that you and I know will have about 12 periods a year for 35, possibly 40 years of their lives. So this is a common everyday occurrence. And yet for many girls and women, the topic of menstrual periods is still completely taboo and not something they can talk about, nor is it something that they can discuss in their place of work, uh, where it's a source of embarrassment and where they often need to be given help. So my name is Leslie Regan. I'm a gynaecologist, I'm still working um, at Imperial in central London. Um, and I'm also the chair uh, of Wellbeing of Women, the charity that initially uh, funded research into every aspects of women's health across the life course. But excitingly, over the last uh, year, we've increased our, or we've extended our strategy to include both advocacy and education, because we all believe that it's really, really important that our charity not just funds research, but also is a source of really reliable information and help to women as they deal with their day-to-day -day lives. And so if you go onto our website, you'll be able to um, go, scroll through a variety of different topics, and you'll also be able to access the films and the recordings of the previous seminars that we've run, not just in this series of Let's Talk periods, but in a lot of other uh, topics as well that are important to women. So I just want to remind everybody that this is being recorded um, and to remind also our audience how welcome they are and that they will be able to receive, they will receive rather if they've registered for this, a copy of the recording at a later date. And you'll also have the option to forward that on to, um, to other friends or people who you think might be interested or indeed share it with your employers um, and the other people that you work with because that might be helpful as well. Now, I'm going to stop talking because the real reason we're here is because we've got two experts to address us. And I'm very, very pleased to be introducing Suzanne McKee, um, who's a member of the Endo Warriors in West Lothian. So this is a, a charity. Uh, it's a remarkable community organization, in fact, of women who've lived with endometriosis. And not only do they provide support to other women who've suffered from this problem and each other, but they've been campaigning tirelessly to raise awareness of the situation. And judging by the response to our email um, uh, alerts about this program, Suzanne Endo Warriors has been pretty successful at that. It certainly is something that's right up on the agenda. So Suzanne is going to talk to us in a few moments uh, about how she was diagnosed with endometriosis having suffered from really appalling, debilitating periods since being a girl. And um, she's going to take us through um, a case study. And I'm then going to turn to our other experts, my colleague and personal friend, Professor Andrew Horn, who really is the expert in research into endometriosis and has done so much to push this forward and to find answers to the many questions that we all have. So, we are very lucky to have two really expert people to join us. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Suzanne because I know that the audience will really, really benefit from hearing her story. Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us today and for being so brave to share your story and give your advice to those other women who may be a little bit further behind you in that journey. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um... Hi everyone, and um, thank you for having me here um, to discuss basically my journey of endometriosis. Um, it started at a really young age. I probably started to develop and hit puberty around the age of nine. Um, and my periods didn't start till I was 11. Um, luckily my mom talked to me all about my periods and the change that you go through. So I wasn't scared when it happened. Um, but they were very heavy um, and I remember I was at school and going to the school nurse about it um, and it was just sort of like oh here you go here's something to wear and you can that will see you till you get home sort of thing and 
at first we just sort of thought my body's just getting used to it and eventually they'll maybe calm down but they they didn't they were just getting heavier there was lots of clotting the pain wasn't like nothing that I had ever dealt with before and paracetamol was what we were told to take and paracetamol didn't do a thing for me um and we continually went to my GP with my mum and it was it's a bad period it's a bad period you'll grow into it your body's just starting off give it a year you'll be fine that's what we heard the whole entire time until I was 12 when they decided to put me on contraceptive pill and looking back now I sort of regret going on it but I thought that was the right thing to do at the time. My mum didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. So we just went with what the GP said. And I stayed on that without any kind of break whatsoever um, for 13 years. Um, and during that time, it didn't really stop the periods. It didn't really control them. They were still irregular and all over the place. They were still heavy. There was still massive clots and um, there was still a lot of pain but in between all that my body was then changing at the same time of going through puberty and I ballooned in weight um, I was not just your moody teenager I was extremely moody um, and this continued and they said that it would be fine um, the pill would sort it all and when I came off it whenever I chose to you know, it, it would help and my, my periods would be different. And like I said, after 13 years, I came off it and they weren't any better. They were worse. And there was no control to them. And the pain was just like somebody ripping my insides out is the only way I can describe it. You feel like somebody is twisting and pulling and hacking away and you sort of think to yourself this is normal and you keep getting told it's normal and it's not and I went to back to my GP and it was a different GP who talked me through different options told me that I should give my body six months see how it copes and then we will try something else and I didn't even last three months. Um, they weren't, it was continuous bleeding. It wasn't even like a period. And then having your 28 days break, it was just constant bleeding. And I then went on the injection. And that is the only time that I had no bleeding at all. I felt for me personally, that the injection was a little bit better than what the pill had been. I didn't have the side effects that the injection gave me that some people can get. Um, but for me, it agreed better than what the pill did. And I then was only to be on that for five years because if you want to have a family, they don't really want you to stay on that for too long. So after my five years were up, um, it was a case of, right, okay, I'm ready to start a family and we will see what happens. And Everyone tells you, everyone is different. Some people get a period the month after they stop it. Some people, it can take up to a year. And it took me 10 months for my period to come back. And it was still heavy, but it was still all over the place. There was no pattern, no idea when it would show up. Um, and again, went back to the GP. Um, now, every time I'd went to the GP from the age of 11, I always went about my periods it was always just it's just a bad period it's just a bad period this should help this should help and I would get pills thrown at me and some of them weren't suitable for me some of them didn't help me um but I took them because I thought that that was the right thing to do so when I came off of the injection and I went to a different GP because I had my career had moved me across the country and I was in West Lothian and I was with my now husband and the response from my GP was that isn't correct you shouldn't be dealing with this and I'm going to refer you to Gainey and 
she then said that she thought I either had endometriosis or polycystic. Now, I had never heard of either of these things. And I was like, right, okay, what is endometriosis and what is polycystic ovarian? And she explained it to me. And I saw a gynecologist very quickly. Um, and I told him my whole story. And I told them that I'd had a lap previously and the information that they told me about my ovary and where they'd found it and that everything was fine and that I shouldn't have any more complaints. He told me that that wasn't correct, that he didn't agree with it. So he went to investigate. And in the meantime, he wanted me to get an MRI and to get put down for surgery. Now you're fast forward in 22 years after I was first started my periods. So I'm 33 at this point before anyone's even said to me the words endometriosis or polycystic or any kind of gynecological issue. So a lot of people think that endometriosis will show on a scan. It doesn't. Ultrasounds are not that great for showing things like that. MRIs, there is a chance it can show was what um, my gynecologist told me and if you want to say I was one of the lucky ones it did show and it showed it was very bad it was stage four but of course the best way to for them to see would be through a lapros laparoscopy which they did so I had a laparoscopy and they explained what the MRI found they explained that the surgery I'd had previously had actually indicated endometriosis then, but no one had told me. Um, it said that my right ovary was actually attached to my kidney, not in my abdominal wall cavity, where I had been told it had been. Um, and they also said to me that I would possibly have to get uh, one of my tubes removed because it looked extremely damaged in the MRI and you wouldn't be able to use it. So the morning of the operation, I basically felt I signed a part of me away, having to say, yeah, you know, I'm desperate for a family. I've been trying to get pregnant, but you want to take one of my chips away. Okay, so if you have to take it away, you have to take it away. I did not like doing that. I didn't want to do that. Um, and it was really hard. But luckily, they told me that the MRI had kind of over-exaggerated the damage to the fallopian tube and I could keep it. Um, however, the endometriosis was everywhere. It was my pouch of Douglas. It was um, rectal vaginal. It was all over my womb. It was on my bladder. It was all over my bowel. It was in the ligaments behind my womb. And my womb and my bowel were stuck together with it all. And they said it's stage four. You need to have a colorectal surgeon involved in your surgery. And we didn't want to do anything because it could result in anything happening. It could be a stoma. You could have a resection, you know, a colostomy bag. And we don't want to do that to you. Because I had kept going on about how I wanted to, pres to preserve my fertility. I then was put on the menopause to help. That didn't help. <laughs> the menopause is not something you want to go through when you're 33 years of age. And it did not help me. It wasn't for me. Some women it is, but it wasn't for me. Um, the only thing it helped with is it stopped the, the bleeding. Didn't help with anything else. The periods were still having that time of the month become and the pain that I would have. So I would have one good week where there was no pain. I would have the week before I was due, the week of when I should have my periods and the week after. The pain was unbearable. I was put on very high um, pain colours. I was put on amitriptyline. I was put on tramadol. Um, I was given tranexamic acid. I was given paracetamol and after six months, I came off the menopause and said, this isn't for me. I, I want to have a baby. That, that's my ultimate goal. So I was referred to Fertility, who did all of their tests. 
And of course, you feel like you're a pincushion because you're getting bloods and urines and swabs and smears and everything done to make sure that you're viable to have a child. And they then told me I had polycystic as well. So I sort of thought, right, this is just one thing after another. And um, everything that I can possibly try and do to get pregnant, there's so many hurdles in the way. Um, and you try to hold it together and you try really hard to put on a brave face and smile. And in the meantime, you don't want anybody knowing what you're going through because it's too hard to talk about. Um, but I was one of the lucky ones because I was able to get medication from fertility to help me get pregnant, which it did. But unfortunately, I lost my first one. I knew for a week and I was at work when it happened and I hadn't told anyone. So having to then deal with the fact that I've only been on this medication for a couple of months and you get all this hope that, you know, you've had your positive and then it gets stolen away from you again. It was hard. And then COVID hit. <laughs> that lovely thing called COVID and... I couldn't try um, because they were worried about what would happen, what the outcome could be if I got COVID while trying to get pregnant. So I had to wait. And I waited four months before they told me I could start my treatment again. And I did. And luckily, I got pregnant. And I now have a gorgeous 10-month-old daughter who I never thought I would have after six years of trying and going through all of that. And I got her and she's here. And I don't know what I would do without her. So even though I've had a really bad journey, bad's not the word, but I don't want to <laughs> use a, a language that I shouldn't. Um, but I got there and there is light for hopefully majority of people that you can get there and that hopefully that dream of you having a family will actually actually come true now I don't want to lead you into any kind of false pretense we all know there isn't a cure for endometriosis and I have tried a lot of medications and like I said apart from the injection none of it worked for me Pregnancy is not something that worked for me either. I still had to deal with my endo. The only thing that it stopped was the periods, but I still had the pain. I still had it all over my body. That aching pain that you get, that no matter what you do, it doesn't go away. And of course you can't take some medications when you're pregnant. So I was on no pain relief through the whole of my pregnancy. Um, I still got bloating. Um, I still had painful bowel movements. I still had pain going to the toilet, even if it was just to, you know, urinate. I was still getting all of that. And even still, I wasn't, you know, getting any relief afterwards. And I had a lot of issues afterwards. And I had my usual bleed after you had to have a baby. And it went away and I thought, well, my periods were getting a little bit lighter. But then I started bleeding for four months straight every single day. And I sort of thought, oh, God, here we go again. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that's waiting to see a specialist because of what's happened with the pandemic and the pressures everyone's under. So at this moment in time, I'm still having issues. I'm waiting to be seen again and it's not it's not an easy fix none of it is and I think that we just need to make sure that we keep pushing for the research we should keep pushing for people to know about the knowledge and everything just so that we can get it out there and um so that's me Suzanne, thank you very much indeed. It's been really, really wonderful to hear your um, story. Um, 
And when you've got a moment to recover, you look in the chat and you'll see all the fantastic tributes from many, many people in our audience congratulating you, not just on um, your daughter, your wonderful daughter, but also um, on the bravery that you've shown by coming to share your story. So I'm going to let you off the hook for a moment now to just come, you know, to get yourself together. I know it must have been distressing talking about that and bringing up all the memories, but we are so appreciative. And uh, judging by the chats, there are so many women who have had similar problems and are just celebrating for you and with you today on the platform um, that you've had your wonderful daughter. Now, I know that we're all looking forward to hearing from Andrew Horn, and I do need to introduce him briefly, but um, it certainly flag up for our audience how expert he is on this subject of endometriosis. He's the Professor of Gynaecology and Reproductive Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. Um, he's the past chair of the Academic Board at the Royal College of ONG, um, and he's been the UK representative for the European Society for Reproduction. Um, and endocrinology and uh, the Eshri Special Interest Group for Endometriosis. He's done an enormous amount in this field um, and has co-authored a book on endometriosis for patients, which I strongly recommend you get hold of, because he writes very well and very clearly. Um, and it's called The Expert's Guide to Treat, Manage and Live Well with Your Symptoms. But I think the thing that I most want to flag up for you all on in the audience today was that it was Andrew who established the EXPECT Centre for Pelvic Pain and Endometriosis in Edinburgh uh, back in 2015, so it's nearly seven years ago now. Um, and he's really, really brought his expertise and his inquiring mind and his grasp of complex science and the practicalities that he's learned about being a frontline clinician dealing with women and their problems. Um, and so we are very, very lucky to have him here today. And I know that he's going to shine a light now on a topic that can be very, very confusing uh, and very complex, but I suspect that with his usual laser-like ability, he'll be able to wrap it all down for us and we'll all go away feeling that we are a bit more expert about the problem of endometriosis. So Andrew, over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Leslie. Thank you for that uh, very kind uh, introduction and thank you to uh, Wellbeing for uh, giving me the opportunity to to talk today it's it's great to be able to talk about endometriosis particularly as it's uh, endometriosis a action month um as leslie says i'm a, a clinician and a researcher um, in edinburgh and sadly i i uh, hear suzanne's story all too often and this is really because endometriosis is such a a common condition we talk about it being a condition that affects one in ten the equivalent of 1.5 million people within the UK, 180 million uh, people worldwide. So this is, makes it as common as conditions like uh, asthma and diabetes in women. So what is endometriosis? I hope, I hope all of you have heard of it and know a little bit about it, but um, endometriosis is when you get tissue like the lining of the womb, outside of the womb, in unusual places in the body, but most commonly uh, within the pelvis. Um, and we're learning every day a bit more about endometriosis and not all endometriosis is, is the same. Uh, this uh, cartoon here shows uh, that we have three subtypes of endometriosis that we know about. Uh, the commonest subtype is uh, peritoneal or superficial disease, which is found on the, on the walls lining the pelvis. Um, we can see pa patients who suffer from deep disease or infiltrating disease where you get uh, nodules often involving the bowel and the bladder, um, and you can get ovarian disease, this so-called cystic disease, endometrioma, uh, sometimes referred to as chocolate cysts because these cysts fill up with, with altered blood. So different subtypes, learning more and more about the condition um, as we go. But of course, the big problem with endometriosis isn't actually just the fact that uh, patients, people develop uh, lesions. The problem is the range of symptoms that they present with. And, um, we've heard from Suzanne about uh, the many symptoms that she's had to suffer from. And there are many different types of pain that patients can present with. Um, I've listed some of these here. And often the pain can appear at particular times during the menstrual cycle because we know that endometriosis is uh, regulated by the hormone oestrogen. 
But patients with endometriosis as well as uh, pain symptoms can often have bowel symptoms, bladder symptoms. As we've heard from uh, Suzanne, they can present with difficulty getting pregnant. They can present with more general symptoms such as fatigue. And often these symptoms can lead to problems with, with mental health again, uh, such as problems uh, such as depression. Again, we've heard from Suzanne the big challenge that we have in diagnosing endometriosis. Now, you can imagine that if you have a cystic form of endometriosis, that, that will show up on, on imaging, on, on scans. And even deep endometriosis uh, can show up on an MRI as shown here. This is a, a nodule of, of endometriosis just behind uh, the, the uterus near, near the, the, the bowel. But in the majority of cases, endometriosis isn't diagnosed on imaging. Um, and again, as Suzanne has intimated, we need to perform surgery and patients with suspected disease need to undergo uh, general anaesthetic and have a laparoscopy keyhole surgery uh, to make the diagnosis. Um, and as you can imagine, this has contributed to problems in terms of delay in diagnosis. And one of the big um, things that we need to do in, in, the, in, in the context of this condition is shorten that delay uh, and think about ways that we can better diagnose it more, more quickly, such as developing uh, new blood tests. So how do we manage uh, endometriosis? Well, uh, sorry. Um, the, the big message that I'd like to get across is that this isn't a, a condition that is, is easy to manage and it requires not just a gynaecologist but often a number of different specialists just because it affects uh, many uh, systems within uh, the body. As again, we've heard from Suzanne, so often you might have to see a gynaecologist, a pain medicine specialist, a colorectal surgeon, a urologist. Um, and importantly, uh, a very uh, important person within that, that team of people who uh, will manage the condition is the endometriosis uh, specialist nurse. And treatment options fall broadly into either surgery to remove or to destroy the disease, and this is usually laparoscopic or keyhole surgery, or a range of different uh, medical uh, treatments which will often involve pain management, but are largely treatments which we give uh, to suppress the production of, of oestrogen within the body because, as I say, we know that oestrogen seems to drive um, endometriosis. So if we look at surgery, uh, first of all, um, the surgical options are broken down depending on what type of uh, uh, subtype of, of endometriosis a patient presents with. So for superficial disease, we generally try to excise or de destroy the disease. Um, if a patient presents with an ovarian cyst, we generally try and remove that cyst without trying, uh, with trying to minimise the damage uh, to the ovary. And with deep disease, again, we try and excise as much of it as possible. But this is often because it sometimes involves the bowel and bladder very comp complex and should be performed in uh, specialist centres. But the problem with uh, surgery is that not everybody gets better from surgery. And we don't really understand why. And not only do people sometimes not get better, sometimes they get better and then their symptoms recur. And it's estimated around of half of patients who have surgery for endometriosis will have a recurrence of their symptoms within five years. And we don't know whether this is because new disease develops or lesions have been uh, missed at the time of surgery, but it's probably because endometriosis pain is a lot more complicated than we currently understand and we're perhaps ignoring the role of nerves and immune cells um, when we think about uh, operating on patients with endometriosis. What about medical uh, treatment options? Well, I've listed uh, these on this table here and I've put down uh, the treatment options that are available not just in the UK but outside of the UK um, but generally as I say these treatments um, are given uh, to stop uh, oestrogen production so as Suzanne has said uh, some patients are often offered the, off, offered the combined oral contraceptive pill um, progestogens which can be given in a number of different ways either by tablet by injections even through a coil um, and then again, as Suzanne um, has talked about in her story, uh, drugs called GnRH agonists, which are often given as injections to cause a medical, a temporary menopause, and patients need to take these with um, HRT. The problem with uh, hormone treatments is that uh, whilst all approaches are 
equally effective in clinical trials, they don't work for everybody. And as Suzanne has pointed out, often it seems to be a bit of a trial and error and patients go in and think, well, well all I'm doing is trying all these different treatments. Nobody knows what's going to work for me. And unfortunately, that is often what, what happens and patients have to balance up uh, the benefit of the treatment versus side effects of some of these uh, treatments and also the fact that these aren't a cure for endometriosis and the symptoms uh, generally recur once the treatments have stopped. The other problem as well is of course all of these treatments are, are contraceptive um, and patients with endometriosis are a young population who are often wanting to, to have a family. So what are we uh, doing about it? Well, I'm, I'm just going to uh, briefly talk you through some of the uh, research that we've been doing in Edinburgh. And I'm very grateful to Wellbeing of Women who um, actually uh, gave me two grants which um, have supported this uh, research. This is my research uh, team, a photograph we just took last week, all wearing yellow to, uh, as a symbol for, for endometriosis um, awareness month. So, Wellbeing of women allowed us to uh, look and try and better understand what causes the, the commonest or what might be the cause of the commonest type of endometriosis, which, as I said, is superficial peritoneal disease. Now, we know from uh, data from a, a, a long time back that one of the uh, potential ways that peritoneal disease develops is due to something called retrograde menstruation. And so this is when uh, menstrual tissue goes up through the fallopian tube into the pelvic cavity. Um, but we know that this occurs in around 80 to 90 percent of, of, uh, of people. Um, and so why does this uh, tissue uh, stick, invade and attach in some people uh, and not on, in others? Um, and so we were interested to see whether it was due to changes in the mesothelium, the, the cells that line uh, the pelvic cavity, um, and see whether that uh, then predisposed patients to developing uh, the condition. So what did we do? Well, with uh, permission of our patients who were undergoing surgery for suspected endometriosis, uh, we collected biopsies of endometriosis if they had the condition, and we collected biopsies of the peritoneum um, at the time of surgery, whether they had the condition or not, um, and we collected fluid from inside um, of the pelvis. And what we were able to show is illustrated in this uh, cartoon here, and I don't want you to worry too much about some of the compounds, um, but essentially we started to look at the metabolism of the cells within the pelvis. So on the left hand side you've got the uh, pelvic peritoneum, so the, 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 the cells uh, surrounding the endometriosis. In the middle the fluid which sort of, if you like, bathes the pelvis, the peritoneal fluid, and on the right hand side an endometriosis lesion. And what we were able to show was that the uh, metabolic drivers uh, for uh, something called glycolysis, so this is uh, glucose production in the lesion um, and in the, the cells round about the lesion uh, were increased. But most importantly, what we noted was that uh, within the pelvis, there were higher levels of something called lactate, which you may have heard of uh, within the peritoneal fluid. And lactate is important because it's been shown in other conditions, particularly in cancer, to promote the steps that we think are important for the development of an endometriosis lesion. So we talk about adhesion, the stickiness of the cells, invasion, the fact that they can burrow their way into tissue, angiogenesis, the fact that they can form their own blood and even nerve supply. So what we decided we wanted to do was try and target the lactate uh, that's higher in patients with endometriosis in the pelvis and potentially develop uh, a new treatment. Um, and in order to try and uh, develop this treatment a bit more quickly, uh, we, did, uh, we used this approach called drug repurposing. So this is where we looked to drugs which had been developed uh, for other conditions to see if we could use them uh, for endometriosis. Um, and we identified a, a drug that had been previously used in the context of this pathway that I show you here called dichloroacetate. And this had been used to treat uh, rare metabolic uh, disorders in children for, for many years. So there, there has been some evidence of, of safety of this treatment. Um, it's been used for some time and it had also been used in a number of clinical trials and for, for a number of different cancers, again, because of the uh, properties that I showed you um, earlier. So we then went back to our patients and again, with their permission, 
Uh, we this time, instead of biopsies, we collected brushings of cells within the pelvis and we grew these in the laboratory and then we exposed the brushings from patients with endometriosis to different concentrations of dichloroacetate. And what we were able to show was that we were able to reduce lactate production in cells uh, collected from patients with endometriosis. Um, we then, as often is done in these, these kind of drug development uh, processes, uh, turned to, to animals to try and help us with our research. Um, and we looked to, to mice. Now, mice don't even menstruate, far less spontaneously develop endometriosis. So we had to, uh, first of all, develop a, a mouse model of menstruation and then subsequently a mouse model of endometriosis. And we then um, exposed our, our mice uh, with endometriosis to different uh, amounts of uh, dichloroacetate. And we were able to show that we were able to reduce uh, the lactate in the pelvis, but also reduce the amount of endometriosis uh, within these mice. Um, so we're very excited about this, as potentially it suggested that dichloroacetate could be a treatment, a, a new uh, treatment for endometriosis. Um, and we set up a, a trial <coughs> which we ran in Edinburgh. Now this is, uh, has been quite a small trial and we were very much held up because of, of COVID. We had to stop the trial for quite a long period of time. And our aim was to recruit 30 uh, patients with endometriosis and give them all a different doses of dichloroacetate. And I'm pleased to say that we finished uh, recruiting our patients and we're just um, in the analysis process at the moment. And what we've been able to show is that dichloroacetate um, seems to reduce the pain scores of the, the patients with endometriosis. Um, and importantly, it reduces a global pain score. So we have this uh, questionnaire that we use which um, are given to patients at the beginning and at the end of the trial called an EHP30 questionnaire and as well as pain this looks at all sorts of other aspects of endometriosis and you can see um, that this pain these these EHP30 scores on average fell, fell from 67 to 33 and even more importantly I think what we found is that patients in this study two-thirds of them um, have reported using significantly less pain medication um, at the end of the trial so we're, we're very excited about, about this, but obviously the next step, because this is an open label trial, is that we need to secure some funding to do a blinded study, so a study that has a placebo arm in it, and we're hoping uh, to move this forward um, in the next part of this year. So just to finish with, um, I just want to give you a, a snapshot of some of the other projects that we're doing um, in Edinburgh. And we like to think in Edinburgh that any patient that comes to expect can be offered the opportunity to take part um, in endometriosis research. Um, we ran a research priority uh, setting exercise back in 2017 where we uh, asked patients and clinicians to prioritise research questions in endometriosis and we've used this to, if you like, direct our research um, over the uh, last few years. Um, we've uh, set up a, a biobank of samples within, it, within Edinburgh called EduMed uh, and any patient who undergoes surgery has the opportunity to donate tissue and blood samples and urine samples to this biobank for research. Um, We've uh, just uh, started a study uh, which has been actually supported by uh, the team at Endo West Lothian who fundraised for uh, this, uh, this study uh, to look at the impact of uh, what we call the, the, the uh, blood um, brain, uh, the gut brain access, axis, and we're looking at the impact of diet and endometriosis and on something called the microbiome, which you may have heard of. Um, we're using wearable tech, we're using smartwatch technology to look at the impact of uh, endometriosis in another study called Endotech. Um, you've heard as well about the work that we've done uh, developing animal models and also in developing other laboratory models of endometriosis. And lastly, we've been running, uh, or we are running, large multi-centre trials. Uh, one of them from Edinburgh, Esprit 2, is looking at the impact of surgery on peritoneal disease. Another one that we're working with um, with the Aberdeen group is looking at comparing surgery with medical management uh, for recurrence of endometriosis. So I hope this gives you some uh, hope that there is a, a lot of work going on um, in endometriosis. We collaborate very widely with people nationally and internationally. And I'd just like to uh, finish by again thanking uh, Wellbeing for all their support and thank you for your time and leave you just with a, a list of uh, potential useful sources of information. I've listed uh, some of the patient organisations, um, including Endo Warriors, 
uh, the Royal College. Uh, there are guidelines published which are accessible for clinicians and patients alike, the NICE and ESHRI guidelines, um, and some websites here. And I know that Lena um, has circulated uh, this information, so I hope it's available to everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I'm sure the audience will agree with me that um, you certainly didn't disappoint us. A very complex subject made uh, very, very clear. And thank you. There are lots of um, wonderful um, accolades to you and your work in the chat. But I thought you'd also like to hear that Ginny Clark from the MRC uh, group in Edinburgh um, has joined us and she's going to direct in your next comms letter going out next week, she's going to direct uh, the readers um, to our YouTube website so they'll be able to see the, um, the video there or the recording there. And of course, I mean, one of the other things I would like to say before I start off the questions is we're very proud of you at Wellbeing of Women that, uh, and also that the money that we've raised for research in the past, you've been able to utilize to really make a difference to women's lives. So to everyone who's tuned in today, do go onto the website and if you can donate, or if you can think of ways of fundraising to improve the amount of research we fund into this area, you can see how much there is to be done and how um, and um, hungry and eager the scientists and the clinicians are and the patients uh, to get more research undertaken. So please help us achieve that. So um, wonderful comments still coming in about your story, Suzanne. And I think lots of questions also about how women can, not just for themselves, but a lot of people talked about their daughters suffering or other members of their family. How can they get referred to centres like yours, Andrew, because my understanding now is that we have a much better recognition of the fact that this is not just seeing a doctor who's good at endometriosis, it's actually about a multidisciplinary team and all sorts of other facilities. You mentioned nurses, physios, it's not just surgery and drugs. So how can they get referred or, or is there a network that they can look for uh, on a website or online? Uh, yes, so the, the British Society of uh, Gynaecological Endoscopy, which is, you know, as you know, affiliated with the, the Royal College, now accredits um, centres throughout the UK. So there should uh, be a centre local to you. Um, if you go onto their website, they will list um, the centres and then you should be able to ask uh, either your GP or your local hospital to refer you to these centres. Um, now, obviously, sometimes it's challenging, particularly, I think, in the north of Scotland, the islands, to get to these centres. Um, so there's usually also, there should be a, a, a named specialist within your local hospital um, who deals with patients with endometriosis. I think one of the challenges is it is such an evolving field. Um, every day we're, we're learning a bit more about the condition. Um, I think, you know, as Suzanne knows, not everybody feels they're, they're properly listened to. So I think as a, a patient, it's really important to arm yourself with as much information as possible. So when you see your GP, you might have to direct them to some of these resources. Um, and I, I think that's absolutely fine. GPs are very busy. Similarly, if you're in a hospital, you can ask to be referred to one of these centres. Thank you, Andrew. So um, uh, I know that the wellbeing team are going to send out the link to all those websites and those really good sources of information to everybody here. So please feel free to share them. They'll be coming tomorrow with a recording and a, a signpost to our YouTube channel. Lots of questions um, also about um, how, how pushy women should be. That was the word that's been used several times. Uh, when their doctor says, oh, well, it's your periods. And um, I thought I'd ask Susanna if she'd like to comment about that. I mean, my own response is, well, you must be as pushy as needs be to get seen and get, get someone to refer you. Suzanne, would you like to make a comment about that? You're mute. Sorry, my voice is going again. <laughs> um, I think just, I was lucky with my last GP that I saw. Um, because I was able to just go to her and she had me straight away. But what I have said to a lot of women is um, if you keep a diary of everything um, and write down everything that you're, sorry, <coughs> everything that you're experiencing and if you put down 
um, you know, what your cycle's like, what you get before, during and after. Put down everything that you've tried. Um, we might say to you things like, um, you know, do you know what flares up? You know, is it alcohol? Is it, um, Professor Horn was talking about a diet. Um, so is it certain foods? Um, you could put on if it's certain things that you do, exercise, um, what your sleep's like. Um, stress is a major thing that will make you flare up as well. So if you go armed with everything you, you've got and your journey and what, you're, what you've went through and what you've tried and things like that, you can then go to your GP. And like Professor Horn said, and even if you've got all of these links as well and you've researched everything into endometriosis and just say, look, this is what I am experiencing. I need to be seen by somebody who can actually tell me that I have this or not. I need to be seen by a specialist and you ask to be referred and you just keep going. Yes, of course, they are very busy. Obviously a pandemic hasn't helped, but you do not just need to keep going to them and saying, look, we've tried this, it hasn't worked. This hasn't worked. I need to find something of a solution. I mean, scans aren't always going to show it. MRIs aren't always going to show it. They do need to do a laparoscopy. We know obviously there is constraints with that as well because there's a waiting list and everything, but you need to be, even if you're just seen by the specialist to begin with, you're then on that track. So I would just very politely keep going back to your GP and just be armed with everything that you can possibly take with you to say, this is, this is what's happening. This is what you need to help me with. Um, and they might refer you to try different things. And like I said earlier, what works for one person doesn't always work for someone else as well. So, so don't give up. No, keep don't keep give on up. trying the various options. Now, Kirsty's helping us by saying there's a great diary that you can fill out for your GP on the Endometriosis UK website. So let me just point everyone to that. And then, Andrew, I, I just wondered if you could help us with a little bit about dietary triggers, because there's quite a few questions about that. And also things that, may, in your experience, women tell you have made their endometriosis flare. Yes, so a very, very good question. So, so there are lots of diets on the internet, as people know, that are purported to help with endometriosis. And I think, I think there, there are two challenges. One, uh, the research in this field ha hasn't been great. But the second challenge is it, it, it is actually very difficult to do uh, as you can imagine, research on diet. Um, we've tried to do research on supplements, so we've looked at um, fish oils in the context of endometriosis because of their anti-inflammatory effect. Um, and we're trying at the moment uh, to look at uh, diet uh, more, more broadly in terms of the, the microbiome, the bacteria in the gut, um, by asking patients to, um, first of all, complete dietary questionnaires and have repeated uh, blood and faeces sampling so that we can look at this. It sound, sounds horrible, but that's that's the way we have to uh, do it. So I think the one thing I would say is um, there isn't a particular diet that's available yet that, that has had an evidence base behind it to say it works. But I do believe anecdotally that, that people, and Suzanne may want to com comment on this, um, uh, find that if they look at their own diet and they carefully remove different things, they do find that there are certain things that, that might uh, make their, their flares worse or um, that make, make them feel, feel better. Um, flares, I think, are another really difficult um, problem, uh, particularly flares that aren't cyclical, that, that just appear randomly at, at any time. I think, again, it's, it's kind of personal experience. Some people have no warning of the flares and don't know what's going to cause a flare. Other people say, you know, if they have a glass of wine, it causes a flare. So again, this is an, an area that we really need to research uh, better and better understand. And I think the main thing is to then be equipped to manage that flare. So talk to your GP, your doctor about what you're going to do when you get um, that flare up of sim symptoms. Sometimes we give people uh, a rescue package of pain medication that they can use then, which can be helpful. Thank you. So just, you know, keep your horizons broad, I think is the message and try and remember that what doesn't work for your friend or does work for your friend may be helpful for you. A couple of patients, in fact, and a couple of people I think I've referred to your specialist clinic have told me that this FODMAP diet um, is helpful. Why is that? Can you can you give us a feel for that? Um, 
so so yes again uh, this is, it's all quite anecdotal isn't it and i mm. think it's it's all about you know being careful about what you eat it's about thinking about uh the things that cause uh, that we know foods that cause inflammation foods that potentially maybe um are sort of estrogenic so we know that um estrogen oh, is, a, is a problem i think also um many people with endometriosis have bowel symptoms, not just painful bowel, bowel symptoms, but maybe diarrhea and constipation. Um, so again, the FODMAP diet can be helpful with that. And the main constituents of a FODMAP diet, or rather it's an exclusion thing, isn't it? You exclude yeah, the they, mainly exclusion, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and what about um, something that I've, I've talked to my urogynecology colleagues quite a lot about, and this interest now in mast cells. Uh, I mentioned that because of the inflammatory process that you've highly delighted for us in the science. So it, it, mast cell activation and then the use of some of the more recent generations of antihistamines. Is there any mileage in that with endometriosis? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. My colleague, um, Philippa Saunders, who I think you know in Edinburgh, is very interested in mast cells in this context. And it, it's, it's slightly come about because also uh, patients with endometriosis are maybe more common to develop at atopic conditions, so allergies, asthma as well. So I think there's def this is definitely an area that's uh, ripe for research. A lot of the focus has been on another uh, a cell which you, you'll be aware of, which some people may have heard of, called macrophages. But I think people are looking much more widely at immune cells and mast cells um, in this context. So it's a, it's a really exciting area, I think. So masses and masses, and we must get funding to get more research done in this area because mm. it really is ripe for development at the moment and so many great ideas um, to be pursued. So um, many, many more questions. I can't do justice to them all, but I think so many uh, people have commented about some of the things that have helped them or not helped them, further emphasizing what Suzanne and Andrew have said, that you need to try everything, keep your mind uh, open to different suggestions and, and share them as well. Share them on your, on your social media feeds. If something's helped you or something's triggered you, share that information with others, please. Um, many, many questions about the surgery, and Andrew. Um, do you have any sort of hot tips as to how to recover from surgery if you've had extensive endometriosis? Are there some favourite tips that you would tell your patients? Um, so the first thing we, we say that every day should be a better day. So I think when you're recovering, but I suppose we say that generally for all surgery. So in the immediate aftermath, just be, be conscious, you should be slowly getting better. I think because endometrial surgery is performed generally by keyhole surgery, um, as patients and even as clinicians, we often forget the extent of surgery that's been carried out because you know you maybe don't have a big um, abdominal um, incision. So it, it is about also just being cautious, taking things slowly. Um, we tend to say to our patients, you know, uh, the recovery time is going to be likely to be two months, maybe three months after surgery. Um, I think it's all about just being sensible in terms of gentle exercise, uh, gently reintroducing things into your diet. Um, there isn't a particular um, formula that we give uh, to our patients, but uh, that, that, that's, really, that's really it. Yeah, so thank you for that. And lots and lots of comments about how debilitating this is and um, how much this, is, this webinar has helped and provided people with crucial information. You won't be surprised to hear as well as a lot of comments about, well, why is it underfunded research? Well, I would argue that women's health research has been underfunded for decades. And that's why I feel so passionate about well-being of women uh, as a charity um, and to flag up, you know, if nothing else, to increase the advocacy and the education about these very common problems. And what I'd like to finish off by saying is reminding our audience that as Andrew said, this is a problem that affects a lot of women. It's just as common as diabetes uh, and lots of other disorders which are very, very well funded. So I would make a plea to our audience today to talk about what you've learned today, to advertise well-being of women, advertise Andrew's clinic, tell Suzanne's story. She's very kindly you know, donated it to us effectively. And so many of you in the audience have resonated with that. So we need to talk women's health right up the agenda. And things that happen to women every month 
need to be right at the top of the politicians and the policymakers um, wish list. So I think that the thing we've got to do is we've got to educate our politicians to understand what women need and what women want. And on that note, I'm going to be very well behaved because it's 1356 and I have to finish before um, uh, 2 p.m. So I'm going to say thank you again to Suzanne. We are so grateful to you. Thank you for sharing and being so brave. I'm very, very thrilled that you've got your daughter. I was hoping that you might show us a photograph of her, but perhaps that's not possible, or perhaps you wouldn't want to, that, that may be invading your privacy. But also, Andrew, thank you so much for um, being such a great ambassador for the importance of research into this field. And thank you for your, you know, your kindness and participating in this webinar. Um, and as I said, as I started off when I introduced you, we're all very proud of you at Wellbeing of Women uh, and hope that we'll be able to do further uh, funding for your research in the future. So on that note, everybody, have a lovely rest of the day. Uh, remember that it's Endometriosis Awareness Month um, and do your bit to talk up this topic and get it right to the top of everyone's agenda. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, and thank you to the Wellbeing of Women team behind the scenes.